Um, I, I, first of all, I was a little bit curious how many people know something about Linderman or have read a Linderman book, or quite, quite a few, half the people. Um, I'd just like to start out for, uh, by acknowledging something in this old Montana Historical Society pamphlet that I pulled out of one of my <coughs> files um, the other day while I was getting ready for the talk. Uh, because I'm really a supporter of the Historical Society being able to stay in this site here near the Capitol, as it is right now. And uh, how uh, 25 years ago, as a young uh, researcher coming over here and uh, finding my way to the Historical Society, and some years later realizing, just sort of dawned on me how close it is to the Capitol, uh, I, I think it's really a wonderful site and location for a place where people can come and learn about our history. So I just thought I'd remind people, if you've, or if you've never heard this quote, from Thomas J. Dimsdale, who uh, was the editor of the Montana Post in Virginia City in 1865, and that he wrote, it is for our people now to say whether they will preserve the early history of Montana in an enduring form, so that after times may know the thrilling drama here enacted. And I, I just, I, I read that years ago in this, and I thought, how far seeing and how, how far thinking to uh, actually want to preserve our history back when the territory was just starting up. So I think that's a good quote to remember for supporters of the Historical Society. And um, uh, we'll to get into the tune here with Frank Linderman. This is a picture from probably around the time he was living here in Helena. I'm going to start out by thanking the Historical Society for having me here tonight, for Kirby for arranging this lecture, and Bob Brown for um, putting us together to have me come over and give this talk. In order to give a sense of the far-reaching breadth and range of Montana history that can be mined from the facts of the life and writings of Frank Linderman, I'm going to first relate the titles and opening paragraphs of a selection of three slideshow lectures I gave around the state of Montana back in the early 1990s. Then we'll look at some of the content of a fourth lecture given in 1994 to see whether it still holds interest and relevance for people today, people who seek to know the spirit of the land in the big sky. And I've given, uh, I, don't, I don't even, I've lost count of how many talks, maybe 60 or 70 or 80 around the state over all the years, but I went back to the early lectures and found four that I had given at the history conferences or here at the society. And I thought that that would give an idea of the range of information found in the Linderman um, archive and, and writing. I just got to get a little more light here. After five years of studying Frank Bird Linderman's published writings, researching the Linderman archival collections at the University of Montana in Missoula, and the Museum of the Plains Indian at Browning. And completing my master's thesis in 1989, the first public lecture I gave about Linderman was at the 17th Annual Montana History Conference in Kalispell in October 1990. It seemed fitting at the time, considering that he both began and ended his many years of Monta in Montana, living in the Swan River and Flathead Lake area of Northwest Montana. The slideshow lecture, titled Frank Bird Linderman's Transmission of Native American Autobiography and Legends, or Frank Bird Linderman, Sign Talker, and Raccoon Tour, began with one of my favorite quotes from his writings. Suyape, white man, if you would listen to Kootenai tales of old man, come with me. I will take you to the lodge of two comes over the hill. 
His lodge is tall and white with a smoky top, and it stands tonight alone under the moon by the flat, lapping waters of Flathead Lake. The great stillness is there, Suyape, and yet there are noises, but these only make the stillness deeper. When the noises come, you will listen until they come again. It is while one waits for the noises that the stillness is deepest. Then it is like a soft robe about him, and his heart sings. At first, there will be only the lapping of the waters, lapping, lapping, as though little children were playing. Then, far out on the dark lake, where the waves reach far but touch nothing, the spotted loon will laugh, and the gray goose will gonk at the light in the white lodge of two comes over the hill. These are the noises that are in the great stillness, Siape. Will you come? Now, uh, while, while I'm giving the lecture, at times, if you would like, I could point out what the photos are from. They're all of places where Linderman lived or about which he wrote. And so even if you see some rocks, they're from the land right where uh, maybe his cabin was or something. So this is Goose Island out in Flathead Lake, out away from Goose, the shore at Goose Bay where his uh, later home still stands. But that's called Goose Island. That's how Frank Linderman opened his third book of Indian legends, Kootenai Y Stories, with the voice of his friend walks in the water inviting him to enter the great stillness. This elegant passage reveals one of Linderman's main incentives for writing, to instill in others a deeper understanding of the great out of doors. For he believed that an appreciation for nature helps develop good citizenship. During this talk, which was back in 1990, scheduled in the History Conference's session titled Native Language Projects, I'll be showing slides of places where Linderman lived in Montana and the natural beauty of which he wrote. I'll give a brief background of his life, then focus on his style and methods of translation of the stories of his Indian friends. So that was the lead in to that first lecture I ever gave about Frank Linderman and his works. I became a member of the Montana Committee for the Humanities Speakers Bureau in 1991. It's now called Humanities Montana. Over the years since then, I've given lectures in many communities and on reservations around the state, presenting different information from Linderman's life history and writings, depending on the place and audience, and incorporating my visual imagery and archival photos to inspire the imagination and breathe life into the stories of days gone by. In October 1993, I presented a talk at the 20th Montana History Conference, held at the University of Montana in Missoula. The title this time, Frank B. Linderman and the Rocky Boy Renegades. It starts off with a quote from a newspaper article published in the Great Falls Tribune in April 1916. This is uh, at the, at the uh, Rocky Boy powwow, looking from the distance over where the lights are is the powwow grounds and the, the sky in the evening. Manitou, the god of the red man and protector of his children on earth, speaks in the sighing of the summer wind across the prairie, as well as in the thunder that rolls across the mountaintops, and his voice is the voice of the giver of all good. This story about Frank Bird Linderman and the Rocky Boy Renegades centers on the spiritual connection between Linderman and his friends among the Chippewa Cree Indians of Montana. Also, since Linderman received an honorary doctorate degree from the University of Montana in Missoula in 1927 and was a frequent lecturer here in the 1920s and 30s, it complements the theme of this year's conference, back in 1993, Higher Education in Montana, a Centennial. Linderman was honored by the university back in uh, 1927 when he received that honorary doctorate for his literary work and his research in the field of Indian customs, beliefs, and traditions. Professor Harold G. Merriam, 
founder of the 19, in the 1920s of UM's creative writing program, who knew Linderman for the last 18 years of his life, wrote of the author, he knew Plains Indians as friends whom he admired. He also, being curious about their inner life as well as the outer, before white contamination, treasured their legends and beliefs and their relationship to all that is in heaven and on earth. I took this picture of dew on the grass, thinking of his good friend, a, a, a Chippewa medicine man named Full of Dew, who you'll hear a little bit about, just a little bit later. The 21st Annual History Conference was held in Red Lodge in October 1994. The topic was again fitting to the locale. I called this lecture, The Sacred Value of Chief Plenty Coup's Home. It began, it was hot, very hot, 100 degrees in the shade that day in June 1988 as I drove the dust, dusty back road north into the Crow Reservation. I had been gone from Montana all winter and spring. During that time, I was researching the writings of Frankfurt Linderman, and in particular, his two great works, American and Red Mother, the life stories of the Crow Chief Plenty Coup and Pretty Shield, a Crow medicine woman. Now, with deep reverence and an underlying excitement, I was approaching Plenty Coup's home and the setting of his great medicine dream. This is called The Medicine Rock, and he writes about, it's in the book, uh, Plenty Coup, it's mentioned a number of times, I think, where the dwarf people lived in the Medicine Rock. And those are um, offerings, of a pile of rocks that people put when they're making prayers. <coughs> Having read Linderman's book so thoroughly, these places came alive as I recognized Arrow Creek and the fasting place. Uh, let's see, I got lost there. That's his home. It's a state park there. And the little building to the left is, was his trading store, Plenty Coup. And he lived in the home. He actually like, kind of just lived in the kitchen. And in the story, Plenty Coup, Chief of the Crows, his wife, um, maybe she has drying racks outside to dry the meat. And then it starts to rain, and she brings them into the living room to keep drying the meat. And when I first went there, you couldn't go in the house. It was all closed up and deteriorating. But it has since been, uh, pr preservation work has been done on it, and you can go in and walk around. And there's a little museum there off to the side. So I recognized Arrow Creek from my readings, and the fasting place, the medicine rock, and the shady grove of tall cottonwoods that surround the home and trading store of Chief Plenty Coup and his sacred spring. This is the sacred spring. It's a little walk down from the house, just down the slope. And the spring there is right down in there, in there, and that's a big cottonwood tree there. And off in the distance is the fasting place, the square white butte, off in the distance. With leaves rustling in the trees above me and heat waves dancing over the fields in the distance, I could almost feel the pulse of the past in the present moment of this place. My journey to the home of Plenty Coup was like a passage over a threshold, through a doorway, into the world of a people whom I could never know, yet from whom I could sense the gift of their love of life and the richness of the landscape of Montana. That's the little trading store there. For these reasons, I wish to share with you my perspective of the sacred value of Chief Plenty Coup State Park, an American home. First of all, I believe this is a sacred place to be honored and cared for simply because it is, because it exists, because Plenty Coup had the foresight to donate it as a memorial, as a token of his friendship for all people, both red and white. So that was the uh, little opening of the third lecture. And then the fourth lecture was given right here at the Historical Society on November 16, 1994. 
for the Friends of the Society meeting and a reception for retiring education officer Joan Hafer, who invited me to speak that day. The Great Stillness, Visions and Native Wisdom in the Writings of Frank Bird Linderman. That was what I called the lecture back then. It was based on an essay I wrote for the anthology, New Voices in Native American Literary Criticism, published by the Smithsonian Institution Press in 1993. That was this book here. And it's, a, it's an essay in the book. And I spent uh, a number of months writing that with the intention that it would then provide a present day Bibio bibliographic list of all of Linderman's writings that had ever been published and that carried any information in them about Native American people. Most of those books had been out of print for years, so I, I wanted to put a list into the public realm that would, uh, and give a sample of the type of work that's in the writings. The essay begins with a quotation from Out of the North, an historical account of the Blackfeet Indians, written by Linderman in 1935. They were firm believers in luck and in the medicine conferred in dreams. Men often starved and even tortured themselves in preparation for desired medicine dreams. Then, weakened both physically and mentally by enervating sweat baths and fatigue, they slipped away alone to some dangerous spot, usually a high mountain peak, a sheer cliff, or a well-worn buffalo trail that might be traveled at any hour by a vast herd of buffalo. And here, without food or water, they spent four days and nights, if necessary, trying to dream, appealing to invisible helpers, crying aloud to the winds, until utter exhaustion brought them sleep or unconsciousness, and perhaps a medicine dream. If lucky, some animal or bird appeared in the, to the dreamer, offering counsel and help. Thereafter, the bird or animal appearing in the medicine dream was the dreamer's medicine. These are teepees at a uh, head smashed in buffalo jump up north of of the Blackfeet res Reservation up north in Canada. And those other pictures were from different perspectives of Chief Mountain up at uh, Glacier Park and Blackfoot Reservation. It goes on in this lecture. While I was writing this essay, a family member sent me an old tattered on manila envelope covered with red geometric designs and figures and the words Blackfeet Indians of Glacier National Park written across the faded blue border in pencil up there. Uh, in pencil on the front of the envelope are the identifying words I wrote long ago for grade school show and tell. Celeste R, grade three, age eight, October 22, 1954. Frank Linderman's name is on that envelope. In 1935, he was commissioned by the Great Northern Railway to write an authoritative article about the Blackfeet, which he titled, Out of the North, to accompany drawings by German artist Weinhold Rice in a publication called Blackfeet Indians. So in the packet were these pictures, the drawings, and a little booklet, thin, the size of the envelope, but a thin little monograph. And that was all reprinted some years ago in this beautiful color book here. Uh, it's probably out of print now again, but maybe in the 80s this was published with the Linderman piece of writing in it. So you can see that after the lecture if you want to. This story and packet of drawings first came into my life when I was seven, while on a camping trip through the West with my family. For many years after, while growing up near Chicago, I often sat for hours looking at the 24 prints by Weinhold Rice, famous for the colorful designs and clothing, the exotic hairstyles of the people, the strong but saddened faces he depicted of the Blackfeet 
wizened elders, men and women in their prime, innocent children, and families. When I was 14, I spent two weeks in Montana on a fire lookout on the east side of the Mission Mountains overlooking the Swan Valley where my brother had to uh, man that lookout for the summer. So my parents and my sister and I came out to visit. While there, I was enthralled by the grandeur and ineffable silence of the surrounding mountain peaks, the valley far below us, the expansive sky above. Never before had I experienced such power in nature as when, on stormy nights, lightning bolts flashed and cracked around us and rolling thunders rumbled and shook the mountains. At dawn, I was amazed to find the valley below had filled with a white sea of mist that slowly lifted to reveal faraway trees, rivers, waterfalls, and lakes in delicate detail. Most brilliant in my mind's eye was Swan Lake at the north end of the valley, a deep reflection of the play of light across the sky. A child lives in mystical time. During my childhood visits to Montana, I did not perceive where I was, that the places were near each other or so near to each other, that a man named Linderman had been there before me. Years later, after moving to Missoula and becoming involved in research on Linderman's life and writings, it dawned on me that he had loved the same natural place and native people that inspired my youthful imagination. In the late 1880s, he often camped at the foot of Swan Lake, this is Swan Lake here, and was the first white man to trap in that area. As I gradually located and read his books and collections of his correspondence, I was impressed by the history of the man and the content of his writings especially the direct integrity of his character and the honest relationships he had with Montana's surviving, full-blood tribal leaders. Linderman was an early advocate of religious freedom for the American Indian. He respected the dignity of the people, their spiritual beliefs, the wisdom of their relationships with nature. His writings honor their worth. With his literary skills, he drew word pictures that bring us into the mind and experience of tribal historians, the storytellers, who communicated openly with him. This is a uh, scene from the Rocky Boy Powwow Grounds at dusk or sunset. He wrote about the Indians of the plains and forests of Montana with a sensitivity that derived from his personal knowledge of their life in the realm of nature. He had an inside or experiential view into their world, but he was not a man to brag about the high level of brother, brotherhood he knew with the Indians, a trust that allowed him into their personal and ceremonial lives. Instead, he wove allusions to his privileged knowledge into stories that are found within the fabric of his literary works. Here now, 22 years later, I'm going to carry on from the opening of that talk about the great stillness, bringing in it, it into the present with the title, Finding Montana, sensing the spirit of place found in the teachings, the visions, and native wisdom Linderman preserved and transmits to us from the past through his writings. Oops. I didn't want to go past that. Well, that was him as a boy. <laughs> Born in Ohio on September 25, 1869, and raised in the Midwest, Linderman said he couldn't remember when he first began to feel his boyhood ache to go west. It seemed to have always been with him. And how I feared that the west of my dreams would fade before I could reach it, he wrote. When his parents finally gave him permission to leave home, he was just 16 years old. In that picture that we saw just a moment ago, he was 15. In his memoir, Montana Adventure, he wrote, 
I had found a large map of the western states and territories, and that night, for the hundredth time, I spread it upon the floor in my own room to pour over it as I always had, flat on my belly. Long before this, I had decided where I wished to go. But now that my dream was coming true, I needed to be sure I had made no mistake in my choosing. I had to have unspoiled wilderness because I secretly intended to become a trapper. I remember that I felt glad when the Flathead Lake Country in northwestern Montana Territory seemed to be yet the farthest removed from contaminating civilization. I'd go as straight as I could to Flathead Lake. This map, I colored it in, but it's on the inside cover of uh, the, the uh, publication of his memoir, Montana Adventure, that was first published in the 1960s, uh, almost 30 years after he died. Linderman arrived in the Flathead Valley on March 20th, 1885. The area was remote and isolated, and few whites had settled there since the country was too heavily timbered for large cattle ranges and gold had not been found there. He didn't know if the Indians he would encounter were friendly or hostile. In fact, at that time, the Kootenays were very unfriendly to white men, with outbreaks of violence and murders perpetrated from both sides over a period of years. In Montana Adventure, Linderman described the first le leaky cabin that he built at the north end of the Swan Valley, near the present site of Big Fork and his tenderfoot experience the first time he met an Indian, Red Horn, whom he said knew that he was a rank pilgrim, a babe in the woods. As it turned out, he and Red Horn, a renowned flathead warrior, were friends for many years thereafter. During the following winter of 1885-86, some 30 lodges of refugee Cree and Chippewa or Ojibwa Indians camped near the young Linderman, who had just turned 17 in September. That's Swan River. After taking part in the Riel Rebellion in Saskatchewan, Canada, they had followed the son of Big Bear, their leader, to the Flathead Valley. When he met them, Linderman said, they were pictures in the extreme and full of fight a news story written in the 1930s describes their condition. Little Bear Imsees, who was a fierce and resourceful warrior, fled to Montana, crossing the line in the main range of the Rocky Mountains in bitter winter weather, said the article. Nearly dead from the starvation, from starvation, they reached the Flathead Valley. Frank Linderman, now a resident on the shores of Flathead Lake in the 1930s, was then a hunter and trapper in the Flathead country, and it was he who saved the starving Crees and Chippewas from perishing by furnishing them with elk and deer meat. They have never forgotten this kindness, and to this day consider Linderman the greatest of white men. Linderman discovered that these Chippewa and Cree Indians were, quote, unspoiled by contact with the white man, unquote. Big Bear, a strong spiritual leader, had been able to keep his migratory people away from the influence of white missionaries. They had never accepted the religion of the white man and were devout in the observance of their own ceremonies and ritual. Not much was known about them, even in the early 1900s, because they did not mix with the white man's civilization and had not adopted his customs. Wishing to communicate with the Indians, Linderman learned their sign language and sought out the knowledge of the tribal historians, the storytellers. As a boy, he had collected the stone arrow points he found while trekking through the countryside in Ohio. Curious about the origin of these mysterious pieces of stone, he questioned the old ones he now sat among, and in the process, he found himself learning about the origins and wisdom of the people. In his search for answers, he ran across many stories, he said, that he thought were worth saving. This is a page from my thesis, 
uh, about Linderman and the Rocky Boy Reservation. And it says down there, Frank Linderman in front of Indian Lodge after returning from a hunting trip. And I think the date was more like 1912. In Helena. This was in Helena. In his backyard in Helena. Um, the, the, lodge, the lodge was painted for Linderman by Mrs. Running Rabbit and Mrs. Buffalo Body, two Blackfeet women. Wait a minute. During these early years, he gathered many legends from his Indian friends, particularly a Cree named Muskegon, or Jim Richards, and Panatu, or whom he called Full of Dew in his writings, a Chippewa medicine man who, he said, taught him, quote, much of the long ago, in quotes, unquote. Through the legends, he became interested in the Indians' religion, and he found in their beliefs and natural wisdom much worth knowing, he said. Linderman was fascinated by the wisdom and the humor of his Indian friends. During his years in the barely settled wilderness of northwestern Montana territory, he learned the Indians' ways and lived as they did. This fact established his lifelong friendships with the native people and his privileged point of view of their humanity and way of life. This is a view from the Bison Range, uh, looking out over the, at the uh, Mission Mountains. In a letter to his family, written in 1914, he reminisced about his early days in the Flathead Valley and Swan Lake area. He, he wrote, I know every inch of that country, uh, I know every inch of that whole country, on both sides of the ranges, like a book. I have camped in every place along the shore of the lake where m when my white men were not wanted there and Manitou was king. Both that country and I were young. This is a picture of a path along the side of the shore around Goose Bay uh, where he lived in later years. Um, and the lake is right over there to the right. So that's a little shoreline path that went out to a point where he had a, a teepee, that teepee was set up, and Charlie Russell would come to visit and stay there uh, for a short period of time, a couple of years while that teepee was still standing. In 1892, Linderman left the wilderness he loved. A new love had come into his life. It was in DeMarsville, a now extinct settlement on the Flathead River north of Flathead Lake, that in its heyday had been, quote, a boomtown with wild and woolly ways, unquote. That he, there it was that he met Minnie Jane Johns, who had come from Wisconsin to visit her brother Sam Johns, another flathead pioneer. When Linderman realized he was in love with Minnie, he tried to leave the freedom of his life in the wilderness. Now, I just want to point out this picture is not in DeMarsville, it's in, um, oh, it's, it's up in the mountains outside of Kalispell. can't think of the name right now. But um, he wrote a novel, and he named the main character Lige Mounts. He was a free trapper. And he identifies in this picture right there a person named Lige Mounts. So I just put this in because it's kind of a nice picture of some old timers from back then. He wrote about, about having met Minnie and his struggle to leave the wilderness. I found it difficult to quit the old life of a trapper, and yet I knew that I must if I expected to marry her. More than once I made brave attempts to settle down working in the store of G.H. Adams in Demarsville, where my lady was postmistress, and in the town of Kalispell. Sometimes I hung on for several weeks or until some old partner showed up. Then away I would go again into the mountains for a time. Linderman knew the only way he could quit the old life was to leave the country. He looked up a friend in Missoula who gave him a job at the Curlew Mine in Victor as a watchman. 
and I went up looking for it and found this sign, Curlew Mine. There he learned the art of assaying. He and Minnie were married on April 19, 1893, in Missoula. They lived in Victor. Then, in 1894, they moved to Butte, where he worked as an assayer at the Butte and Boston Smelter. It's an old map of Butte. In 1896, they moved to Brandon in the Ruby Valley near Sheridan, Montana, where he did some mining and ran an assay office. That's the Ruby Hotel in Sheridan. When a third daughter was on the way and winter was setting in, he borrowed a wagon, cut some logs, and built a cabin beside Mill Creek. That's the cabin. I found this cabin in 1988, unmarked and unrecognized by the people in the area. And later, I identified it through a photo taken in 1898. So that day, I, I, uh, in ni 1989, I drove up the little, the dirt, it becomes a dirt road going up through this area that's called Brandon that he said was a, almost became the territorial capital before Virginia City. It had that many people there mining. But by the time he lived there, it wasn't so many. And now there's just a few stray homes and cabins up there. But, uh, and then if you keep going, you get way up in the mountains at uh, Branham Lakes. But I was reading his memoir. I had it with me, and I read the part about going cutting logs and all that, and I thought, I wonder if it's still standing. And I had been visiting with this family, Dr. Dave Rossiter and his wife, Bertha. Dave had been a boy. He met Linderman once when he was eight years old. His father was a good friend of Linderman. Um, and he didn't know if Linderman's cabin was still standing. But when I drove back and forth, I got a feeling from this cabin that at least I could use it as an example. And there was another one next, next to, nearby, but I liked the look of this one. And I got out of the car and I took a few pictures and, uh, and I uh, looked up in the sky and saw this beautiful sky up above me. And um, the pictures, I was drawn over to that left side of the cabin roof and around the side was a sod roof that was falling apart and I kind of was drawn over there and took pictures of it and when I saw this old photograph a couple of years later, got a magnifying glass out and started looking and uh, the, the logs here where they're cut at an angle right here. Uh, and the twist of the grain of the wood was exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And this guy up here, this person, I learned later that was his nephew who was visiting, sitting up on that roof there, the area where I kind of had this feeling and went over with my camera and took some pictures. So When I peered inside through, the, through a boarded up window in the cabin, this is what I saw inside. So over the years since then, uh, I went to Sheridan maybe five or six times and gave talks at the public library. Carol Lee uh, Swager, the wife of a retired doctor there, Warren Swager. Carol Lee's very active on the library board, and the friends of the library would have me come over there. And each time, whatever the topic was that I based the talk on, I always worked in somehow these pictures of the cabin and sort of just reminding the people there that there was this cabin that exists that we know something about because I felt like we see old abandoned cabins around the state but rarely know anything about who built the cabin or what any sort of provenance of the cabin. So um, they actually, over the years, eventually were able to take the cabin apart with the help of John Ellingson from Virginia City, knowing how to do that. And they stored all the logs in their swagers in their yard. And then he, uh, rebuilt the cabin at the Robber's Roost. 
So if you ever go to that area wanting to go to Virginia City and you drive through Sheridan and you get to Lauren and right off the highway there is Robber's Roost, uh, which is part of the vigilante history, then you can park your car, go look around, and across the little Ramshorn Creek is where the cabin is sited now. And uh, Warren Swager rebuilt windows to, that look like the, old, like the windows might have looked back then. And uh, the Virginia City Preservation Alliance uh, bought, took over the deed, I think Carol Lee said, maybe for a dollar. <laughs> and, um, and they manage the cabin now, and you, sometimes it's open and there are, are lectures there or meetings and in the summertime. So that's a little story about the Frank Linderman cabin. This is one more shot of it in, in situ, in the site where it was built. And the uh, uh, Mill Creek is just down that little slope there. And one time, I went back in different seasons to take pictures of it in the winter, and I've got pictures when the lilacs are blooming. But I one time uh, went down, ventured through the brambles and stuff down to the creek, and I could see on the other side of the creek some uh, big wood ties or something sticking out, rotted away. So uh, I saw then that there had been a bridge there, and he had a little mine up above on the other side of the creek, and now you'd have to go way down the road and up a dirt road and quite a roundabout way to get to it, but I'm pretty sure that when he lived there, he just went over a little bridge up to his mine, the Wilda Vern mine, named for his two, first two of three daughters. Now you can't get down there to the creek because somebody has, owns the land and put a fence around it. In the spring of 1899, as Linderman was thinking that he might have to leave his family for a while and go back to work in Butte to, in order to earn money for his family, a chance event changed the direction of his life forever when, on a dare, he bought the Sheridan newspaper using a borrowed $5 bill as down payment. It was a, a, a wintry spring day, and uh, he was in the Rossiter store, which is it was this building here, the general store. It's the building still standing. And there was a wood stove and old, some men were sitting around and they were talking. He told them he thought he might have to leave for Butte. And one man said, um, well, the newspaper man was about ready to leave town, so maybe he should go offer to buy it. So he wrote in his memoir that um, perhaps it was only the dare that they dared him to go over there and offer $5 for the newspaper. But he started walking across, across the, the street, the probably dirt street then, and, and, and he couldn't turn back because you know, they had dared him to do it. So one day when I was visiting, Dave Rossiter and I looked with the old Madison County, um, uh, that beautiful book they made of their history with all the pictures of people who had lived there, the ancestors, et cetera. And, and we tried to compare with the front of the buildings, and, and I think his newspaper was right in here. <coughs> this fateful event, he wrote, that he believed in fate, marked a turning point in his life. He became a journalist, eventually a lifetime member of the Montana Newspaper Association. Dave Rossiter's father, Chick, who was the son of the man who owned that general store, Linderman's age was in between H.D. Rossiter and Chick Rossiter. Uh, Chick was younger than Linderman, but he was Linderman's printer's devil for a while, his helper at the paper. So in this picture, Linderman's printer's apron is uh, pretty clean looking. And this picture, which is kind of blurry, it's out of focus here, um, it's very uh, covered with ink. There's <laughs> ink. Let's see if we. So those pictures were probably a few years apart, but it was at the turn of the century, 1899 
and through the first few years of 1900. Well, I'm just going to ad lib here a little bit. This is a, a, his Fox typewriter. It's at the University of Montana's archive. And this is the typewriter he used to write most of his correspondence, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters, and manuscripts in the later years, applying his writing skills to promote awareness of the humanity of the American Indian. He wrote also about finding this I found it in, in my research in three places. I found this, this epitaph or this quote off of a headboard. Of a, uh, and I'm going to read it to you. I have to come over here. It says there, Indian mother dies heathen for children. Chippewa woman wanted to go to hell to be with her offspring. Kalispell, March 28th, special to the, to the paper. Swapping old-time stories with F.B. Linderman recently, H.P. Stanford, pioneer and taxidermist, produced a clipping from his scrapbook, which gives, in a nutshell, much of the Indian point of view. The clipping is in an epitaph from the headboard of an Indian grave at Half Moon and was taken from the inner lake of December 21st, 1890. Illiterate and almost unreadable, still it shows the mother love in the heart of a savage and hints of the struggle of the red man to forsake the religion of his fathers for that of the black robes. The epitaph reads, Born in Winnipeg, 1780, one Chippewa woman by the name of Wolf Woman. Excuse me. Have request she would not be baptized for her children was not baptized, and they was in hell. She would go and be with them. Age 110. And it was rare to find something in Linderman's uh, records more than one place, or in his writings in more than one place. And when I found something in his writings mentioned two, two times, I took note in two different books, maybe, if he wrote about the same little piece of information, I, would, I realized they were important to him. And this I found in three places. Not that particular article, but a typewritten copy of it, and, and then another. Up above is a quote from a character he developed as a newspaper man. He had this persona, Uncle Billy, Uncle Billy sayings, little pithy sayings. A heathen is a party who don't believe in your God. These are telling things about how he felt uh, and, and what he believed about the Indian people's integrity and, and the um, value of their own way of life. While in Sheridan, Linderman became a Mason. Then, in 1903 and 1905, he was elected to represent Madison County in the 8th and 9th Legislative Assemblies. This is uh, an interesting tree I saw riding down the road in the Ruby Valley with the wand. Looks like a, some, someone, <laughs> a, per, a being with a wand in its hand. Um, so here is a picture of the 8th Legislative Assembly, and I put the arrow on there to point out Frank Linderman in the state capital, Helena, Montana. He wrote, The 8th Legislative Assembly was the first to sit in the new capital. So young and uninformed were its members at the beginning of the session that they found it necessary to employ an instructor in parliamentary law before they could even pass their own salary bill. <laughs> well, he was then a lifetime member of the 8th Legislative Assembly, and they continued to meet biannually until they, you know, there were not many of them left, but over many years. And he was the secretary of that group all those years, and he would call the meeting to every other year when they would get together. So they became a, quite a close bunch, I guess. Today, driving 
over here to the building, my husband and I came down this street that goes right past there, and I thought of this picture and how different it looks today. In 1905, the Lindermans moved to Helena, the state capital, where Linderman served as assistant and acting secretary of state, sometimes acting secretary of state, from 1905 to 1907. They bought a home at 524 Lawrence on the west side of Helena. Well, uh, back in the um, late 80s, I think, maybe 19, 19, 1990, I um, was in Helena, and so I decided to go look for this house. I had seen uh, one of his daughters refer to their address as 52, that it had been at 521 Lawrence. But I then uh, noticed on an envelope in the, re in the correspondence records uh, a letter to Chick Rossiter that Linderman wrote and with a return address of 524 Lawrence. So I thought, well, in later years they or forgot what the address was. So I went and looked around at this house. Nobody answered. And um, it was kind of, you know, a little, uh, it had stucco and just, I wondered what it looked like back then. And some years later, I went, I came through here again, maybe 10 years later, and I um, saw that new people lived there. And I, I waited around. Nobody answered when I called out. And um, they were gone when I waited in the alley or the back dirt alley, and uh, this truck pulled up, and I, they, it was them. They had been working, and they went to take, haul away some stuff to the dump. So they came back, and um, I said, do you live here? And they said, yes. And I said, well, I think I know some stuff about this house that you might like to know. And so we visited in their backyard for a while, and um, they pulled out the deeds that they had been given when they bought the house, and back there, way back, about 1906, was a deed with Frank Linderman's signature on it. And I said, well, there are pictures over in the U U University of Montana archives with Charlie Russell and his wife in the backyard here. And uh, so they, they really took that over and, or took on with that idea. And they, they've re, I haven't been there for, uh, gone past it on this trip or anything, but took the, all the stucco off and got down to the old siding and found what the paint colors had been and repainted it, really made a beautiful job of it. And um, you know, have some of Linderman's books, and and so they really took to that that they could know something about someone who had lived in their home before. So it's right here in Helena, five two four Lawrence. During those years, his Chippewa and Cree friends, who over the past twenty years had become increasingly destitute and starving, were camped on the outskirts of Helena, around Garrison Junction, Butte. Great Falls, and other Montana communities. With no treaty rights, no reservation lands, and no rations, they wandered the state. Most were unable to attain permanent jobs, and they were not allowed to hunt on public lands. In fact, they hung around the uh, slaughterhouses in these communities to get the uh, offal, it was called, the, the leftover stuff to eat. In his memoirs, Linderman wrote, the Chippewas and Crees had been camped near Helena for more than a year now. Of course, I had become their arbiter. Their condition was pitiable indeed. Living upon offal garnered from the stingy slaughterhouses on the city's outskirts, and whatever else they could find in Helena's garbage cans, they were in a state of health that was deplorable. Well, this is uh, some st steps out uh, near the street going up the little slope at the house there at 524 Lawrence. I figured some of those Indian people's feet probably walked up these steps. Often hunted from alleys by the police, desperately hungry, clothed in filthy rags, I could scarcely recognize these old friends of other days when there were few fences and plenty of game. This was right around the base of the tree there at 524 Lawrence when I looked around uh, the first day I ever saw the house. I begged clothes for them, carried ads in the city newspapers soliciting cast-off garments, even begging funds with which to buy them food, until people hid away when they saw me coming. 
Chippewas and Crees in need of help were lined up daily at Linderman's office in Helena, he wrote, coming to him for advice and assistance. He was a man they knew they could trust to represent their interests in the white world. Because of the relentless work he did for them, the Indians gave him gifts, including this beaded vest, given to him by his friend Full of Dew when Full of Dew's family had had to eat a horse that Linderman had given them. So that beaded vest is in the archival collection at the University of Montana. It's beautiful uh, turquoise blue colored beads and flowers on there. The landless Chippewa and Cree became known as Linderman's Indians. The history of the band, garbled to suit unfriendly white men, began to spread, Linderman wrote, making my task of bettering its condition more difficult. While researching available information for my Master of Interdisciplinary Studies thesis, A Mountain in His Memory, about Linderman and the founding of the Rocky Boy Reservation, I found this to be true. The history of the band or bands was garbled and confused. That says the subtitle on the thesis, A Mountain in His Memory, uh, says Frank Bird Linderman, his role in acquiring the Rocky Boy Indian Reservation for the Montana Chippewa and Cree, and the importance of that experience in the development of his literary career. The, the title, A Mountain in His Memory, comes from uh, a, 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 a phrase in a eulogy one of his friends wrote, uh, an author from the, from the East, who wrote that Montana should dedicate a mountain in his name, where the white man and the red man might come uh, together to, you know, smoke a peace pipe to, to exchange goodwill. I don't think it's ever happened. <laughs> uh, by the way, I just thought I'd mention that at the History Conference in Kalispell in 1990, this thesis received the William L. Lang Award for the best publication in local Montana history from the Montana Historical Society and the magazine of Montana history, Montana, the magazine of Montana history. The main reason journalists were confused about these people was that while there were two tribal groups, groups represented, they had intermarried and intermingled for perhaps generations. But to find them a home, they had to be recognized as distinct groups. Rocky Boy was a Chippewa and could thus claim to have been born in America, in Wisconsin, whereas Little Bear was considered a Cree, although he was of Cree and Chippewa descent. And Crees were said to belong north of the border in Canada, even though before there was a medicine line or a boundary, they had uh, migrated throughout the, the area, both Canada and Montana area. Thus, the reservation that was eventually acquired for them was named after Rocky Boy, who Linderman described as a gentleman, fine of feature, who was American born. But the Cree influence can be seen even today in the Cree writing on this welcome sign at the reservation, which now isn't standing any longer, but I took this picture uh, the first time I visited the reservation. Little Bear, the Cree leader, whose name I'm sees, means something like bad child or mean boy, because he was a fighter. He was, according to Linderman, a born fighting man, and it was he, rather than Rocky Boy, who kept pushing for a home for their people. He was more aggressive, would come out travel around, come to Helena, look for Linderman, go to the knock on the Secretary of State's office, go up to Great Falls. In 1908, a group of influential Montanans, including William Bowell, editor of the Great Falls Tribune, Paris Gibson, the founder of Great Falls, his son, Theo Gibson, Percy Rabin and artist Charles M. Russell formed a coalition with Linderman to help the landless Indians. I found this picture on a microfilm uh, reel at the university. It's a, from the BIA files. And it said, um, a modern-day curio peddler 
Little Bear, Chief of the Crees. And it's probably from a time when they would go out on the plains here and gather by buffalo bones and um, sell them for, you know, to be turned into fertilizer or um, uh, make items from the bones or the horns. So a modern curio peddler. In January 1909, in the dead of winter, an editorial appeared in the Great Falls Tribune in which Charlie Russell appealed to the people of Great Falls to find compassion and assistance for these destitute people. By this time, Russell and the rest of the coalition had become immersed in their efforts to help the homeless Indians. In a letter to Linderman dated May 12, 1909, Russell even made the words he wrote in English resemble the markings of the Cree alphabet. May 12, 1909. I have seen much traveling talk of the yellow iron hunter, and it is good. He touches the little buttons on his medicine box, that, fa that fox typewriter, that tells what his heart feels. Tis easy, for the father of all has made him so. The picture man has spoken. So that's what it basically says up in, up in that seemingly indecipherable writing. But it, it's made to look like those uh, forms and shapes of the Cree alphabet that had been made up for the Cree alphabet. Linderman, who frequently traveled around the state as a mason and after 1910 as a state agent for an insurance company, often visited Russell at his studio in Great Falls. During those visits, they surely exchanged stories since both men were great raconteurs and master sign talkers and could delight audiences for hours with their fun-loving tales. And surely, while Russell was perched on a stool before his canvas, artist brush in hand, Linderman regaled him with stories, sensitive stories, of the beauty and mystery found in the world view of the Indian people which were eventually published in his books of Indian legends that were illustrated by Russell. We don't know exactly when or how Linderman and Russell met, but Professor Harold G. Miriam, who co-founded the creative writing program at the University of Montana and knew Linderman well from 1920 until Linderman's death in 1938, said that it was around the time when Charlie married Nancy which was in 1896. Miriam, uh, now th this is just a photo I took of, uh, and I brought one copy of um, that long book. It was, I I'll tell you about it, but Miriam wrote that. And then this is, other is a copy of uh, the journal that he published at the University for Creative Writers in Montana and students and, and writers in the Northwest area called the Frontier in Midland. Miriam uh, published that for about 20 years in Montana and really helped get the writing community and the writing spirit uh, developed here in Montana. Miriam uh, contrasted the temperament and personality of Linderman and Russell. He wrote, Frank was nervous, quick of movement, ambitious, and driving in his action while Charlie took life good-naturedly <clears throat> as it came, was without ambition and devoted to his work. <clears throat> in 1979, at the age of 96, Miriam published through the Montana Institute of the Arts an epic poem titled The Long Friendship Between Frank Bird Linderman and Charles Marion Russell, in which he described the two men further Frank was of average height, lean, brisk of movement, well-featured, high forehead, straight nose, firm jaw, confident but guarded, practical, efficient, ambitious, loving the free outdoor life, the beauty of nature, longtime friend of the Indians. Charlie was rather of stocky build, not tall, not short, vigorous featured of face, good forehead, straight, decisive, confident, 
long fingers covered with rings, an impressive man of outgoing nature. Linderman and Russell complemented each other through their mutual appreciation for nature, nature and inspired each other's talents. Russell working with the brush, Linderman with the pen. Knowing of their friendship is important to Montana's historical record because they stimulated in each other the desire to set forth the truth about the Old West in Montana as they saw and experienced it in authentic, historically accurate detail. Well, we know that about Russell and his paintings, but this was also very true about Linderman and his writings and in translating other people's language into English, the care that he took uh, to understand what their true meaning was and what they were telling him. But I wanted to just mention that Linderman um, was a key instrumental figure in getting Charlie Russell this commission for the Lewis and Clark meets the Indians at Ross's Hole that's in the legislative chamber today over in the Capitol building, and also the commission for When the Land Belonged to God, which is here in the, the beautiful painting that's here in the uh, Historical Society's um, Russell, the Gallery of Russell Art. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so I, I want to remember and mention one other painting that's in the gallery here later on. Miriam said that Russell admired the Indians' simple living, their love of fun, their honesty among themselves, their reverence for nature, and beliefs in spiritual forces. But Russell, he said, did not see as deeply into the Indians' inner life as Linderman did. He knew their outward life. On the other hand, Linderman, who was curious about the Indian people's inner life as well as their outer culture, Quote, treasured their legends and beliefs and their relationship to all that is in heaven and on earth, unquote. Oh, I want to keep that picture up there. I'll have to hold it like that. In 1912, Linderman brought Russell and several other men of the Great Falls Coalition to a Fourth of July celebration at Browning. Some weeks before, Little Bear had sent a request to Linderman asking him to help get food for the multitudes of people who would be at the campground. During this gathering, Linderman was able to bring his companions into the Cree Sundance Lodge where Little Bear was leading the ceremony. This experience inside, excuse me, this experience inside the Sundance Lodge deeply impressed Russell for its ceremonial aspects, the firelight, the drumming, the passion of the participants. He wanted to sketch the scene, but Linderman told him to put the sketchbook away. It was also an important event in the long process of finding a home for the Cree in Chippewa when, in the presence of all at the Sundance, Little Bear gave to Linderman the sacred otter skin collar that was uh, on the center pole. In the, in the Sundance Lodge, the sacred otter skin collar that had belonged to himself and his father, Big Bear. In accepting this gift, Linderman accepted the premise behind the gift, a promise that he would not give up until a home was found for the Indian sacred ceremonies, a place to plant their center pole. And I saw that otter skin collar. It's at the University Archives, carefully preserved in a long, box with a cover and tissue in there, archival tissue. It's about this long. It's narrow, thin, with beads, some, some beads on it. And, uh, it was a moving experience to see it after having read about it for so long and realizing how um, uh, pivotal that was to be given that gift and then the, what, the commitment he made to helping them find a place for their people. Excuse me. In another of his colorful letters, written September 14, 1912, Russell 
paid his friend a deep compliment when he implied that Linderman was all Indian under the skin, a real warrior. I looked you over pretty thorough, Frank. If there's anything in reincarnation when you were here before, your name was Lean Man or Long Man. Lean Man or Long Man. It's a cinch it wasn't Linderman. Them days you smoked with the sun. He was your god and you asked no better. And I just thought here that I would mention that uh, this beautiful thick book, beautiful big full color book that Brian Dippy, a Russell scholar, uh, published of all this, uh, all the uh, Russell letters that could be found and, and published, printed. Uh, when I looked in the index of that book, the list of letters uh, to Linderman, that, that was about one of the longest, if not the longest list of, of, of a person who he wrote letters to. In signing off from that letter, Russell said they would meet October 1st at Summers, probably for a hunting trip at the Kootenay Lodge in the Swan Valley. Here they are in the porch at the Kootenay Lodge with Linderman's father and several other men. It's kind of a dark picture, but um, you can always tell Charlie Russell right there. And uh, that's Linderman standing over there uh, near that post. And his father's in here. I think this is his father. Where's my thing? In August of 1913, a year later, Linderman arranged a meeting in Helena with Little Bear and the newly appointed Secretary of the Interior, Franklin K. Lane, to discuss the plight of the landless Chippewa Cree and the coalition's efforts to secure as a reservation for them the lands at Fort Assiniboine, which had been abandoned by the military in early 1912, a year earlier. William Bowl, the editor of the Great Falls Tribune, and several Indian witnesses and interpreters were also in Helena at the meeting. So here they are standing on the curb in front of the Placer Hotel and Linderman's on the right end, and Little Bear's way over there on the left end with moccasin feet and a white man's suit. And the Secretary of the Interior is the man in that light-colored suit coat with uh, his hand in his pocket, and just to, the, to our left of him is William Bowl of the Great Falls Tribune. And the others, uh, they, the... Uh, Several of them aren't identified, but the one next to Linderman, his name was Pat Raspberry, an interpreter. So they were having this meeting, and um, William Bowl, the editor of the Great Fall, oh, I told you that, and they, they were with the interpreters. Then on October 3rd, a couple of months later, Bowl sent a telegram to Secretary Lane to request that the Indians be allowed to, quote, squat on the Fort Assiniboine lands soon to, to get established there, which they weren't allowed to pick up any dead and down timber or, or anything where they could make their shelters. They lived in tattered tents for several winters. Meanwhile, in late September, which Linderman called the Equinoxials, Linderman and Russell headed out on a trip down the Missouri River with Linderman's father and a man named Dr. Nash. They took with them a copy of the Lewis and Clark journals and read excerpts from it along the way. Russell's nephew, Austin Russell, said this trip had a lasting effect on Charlie's art. In quotes. Now he began to paint those ruddy sunsets with Indian figures, not white men, which to Austin Russell seemed to have more magic than all his previous pictures. So it was during this period of time. And there they are after pushing away from the dock at Fort Benton, going on their trip down the Missouri, which Linderman writes about in, in his recollections of Charlie Russell. Russell expert 
Frederick G. Renner said, quote, many authorities feel Russell's greatest work was done between 1902 and 1916, unquote. It was during those years that Linderman and Russell were the closest and were linked in their efforts to help the Chippewa and Cree. In September 1915, several years later, Linderman's first book was published by Charles Scribner's Sons. Indian Y Stories, Sparks from War Eagle's Lodge Fire, illustrated by Russell, is a collection of Chippewa, Cree, and Blackfeet legends told by a tribal grandfather named War Eagle in the book, whose prototype was Linderman's Chippewa friend, Chief Panatu, who he called Full of Dew in his memoir. In the foreword to his second book of Indian legends, Linderman wrote, Many years ago I was in the lodge of Full of Dew, who is War Eagle in this book and in Indian Y stories. He was telling tales of old man. So that's where I put the two and two together, that someone named Full of Dew in Linderman's memoir was the same person as he uh, uh, brings in as the storyteller in these two books of Indian legends, and he calls him War Eagle. And then at some point, I uh, somehow connected in some research that thou, those two names could, were names for Chief Penitu, the, the Chippewa leader. Rocky Boy and the Chippewa people had been camped at Fort Assiniboine for two winters, the Crees joining them during the winter of 1914-15. Now the winter of 1915-16 was setting in, and Congress was due to meet again. In January 1916, Linderman began to prod the politicians in Washington in letters, through letters, saying that if nothing was achieved during this session of Congress, he would send fully illustrated stories with photographs about the Indian suffering to Eastern magazine publishers and offer them for free. He wrote to ethnologist and fellow author George Bird Grinnell in March 1916 that these threats to the people in the politicians from Montana, did more good than two or three years of begging. Just saying that he, now that he had a, a voice outside of the, the borders of Montana through this book, Indian Y Stories, published by an Eastern publishing house, he felt that he would have the um, authority to be able to offer articles to magazines back east and show what was happening here in Montana. During the first half of 1916, and uh, by the way, that picture that was just up there was Rocky Boy's family in camp. And here's a picture now of Rocky Boy himself. During the first half of 1916, in almost daily letters to Washington, Linderman was attempting to acquire more than the meager two and a half townships the government was willing to give the Indians in the Bear Paw Mountains on the abandoned Fort Assiniboine lands. He wrote, quote, and now these people will be expected to raise bananas where no white man could raise a tent <laughs> up in the cold and snowy and windy mountains. Because he was trying to get some bottom land, some low land where they could plant hay or wheat or crops of some sort. Finally, though, after 10 years of persistent attention, the Rocky Boy Indian Reservation was established, not by treaty, but, by, but signed into law by the President of the United States on September 7, 1916. So this year is the 100-year anniversary of the founding of the Rocky Boys Reservation, signed into law, not by treaty. One of the last, if not the last, reservation to be formed. This was an amazing feat because it occurred during the height of the homestead rush in Montana, at a time when many Indians were losing their treaty lands to land grabbers and the allotment process. So, um, just a sec. I have this pointer. <laughs> So I did this little map for my thesis, and uh, it shows the seven reservations in Montana, the Flathead, 
the Black Blackfeet, Fort Peck, the Crow Reservation, Pryor, where Plenty Coos Home is, and the Plenty Coos Home State Park, um, the Northern Cheyenne Reservation, Fort Belknap, and right in here, the Little Rocky Boy Reservation. You can see how it's partly in the Bear Palm Mountains, which is one of those islands of mountains. Uh, and, but they have acquired some lower land in years since. Linderman's interest in the future of the Chippewa and Cree at Rocky Boy continued throughout his lifetime. This is a, a, a lodge pitched for Frank Linderman when he was a guest at the Sundance at Rocky Boy Reservation it's around 1933. It wasn't dated, but it's got to be in 33 or 34. He went over there uh, from the Flathead area several times. People came to get him. Uh, elders came to get him and bring him over there. In 1937, he wrote an article in the Indian Bureau newsletter about the progress of the industrious, hard-working people at Rocky Boy. And in his last public appearance, a lecture in Santa Barbara, California, given only days before his death in 1938, he gave a talk about the Rocky Boy Indians. H.G. Merriam, who in the 1960s edited two unpublished Linderman manuscripts, Linderman's Recollections of Charlie Russell, and Linderman's own memoir, Montana Adventure, wrote in the appendix to the memoir about the importance of Linderman's role in acquiring the reservation. In the sphere of action, uh, Miriam wrote, Frank, along with others, did much to aid the homeless Crees and Chippewas. His account in his recollections is inadequate for it barely suggests the amount of time, energy, and money that he spent on the project. True the true importance of his role will not be known until the hundreds of letters and papers of his have been studied. Accounts heretofore have not assigned to Linderman due credit. It is safe to say that without his efforts, the reservation would have been established years later, if at all. Well, with those hundreds of letters and papers, uh, that they needed to be studied. Uh, that's what I did. <laughs> um, and it was an amazing story to read about through the letters and the correspondence. And Helping the Indian people was not an easy task, nor one that ever let up. But in the process, Linderman was privileged with intimate knowledge of the Indians' inner life, their spiritual traditions, their dreams and visions. He had sat in the lodge of many a good storyteller. In a 1915 letter to his publisher, Charles Scribner's Sons, he described Russell's drawing for the cover of the book of War Eagle seated in his lodge telling stories. From the letter, the cover design shows War Eagle himself seated in his lodge. Of course, this was in color. It was a color plate glued onto the front of the book when the old, uh, um, in the original book. So he is making the sign a very long time ago with his hands, sign language. He is seated on a painted robe. On his left is a backrest supported by a tripod. On the top of the backrest is the skin of an otter, which is the biggest medicine an Indian knows. Remember the sacred otter skin collar? So the, Charlie uh, incorporated that into this picture. In front of him and to his left is his pipe. On the lodge wall behind him, the painting, painted linings may be seen. Before his right knee and on the ground is his pipe case. The animals drawn in Indian style represent the otter, the beaver, and the badger. Below the picture are three of the duck people, followed by a magpie. In April 1916, Linderman met for four days of medicine talk with Chief Big Rock, a Chippewa medicine man he had known for 30 years, to record information and prepare for his writing of his second book of Cree and Chippewa legends, Indian Old Man Stories, 
More Sparks from War Eagle's Lodge Fire, illustrated by Russell, published by Scribner's in 1920. So there's Russell, Big Rock, and Linderman, and they're in front of Charlie Russell's teepee, and it's, and it's uh, um, uh, in Theo Gibson's backyard in Great Falls, near the river. A news story about the event which took place in Great Falls in a teepee owned and furnished by Charlie Russell emphasized the solemnity of the occasion. The origin and the ancient customs, superstitions, traditions, and religion of the Chippewas were discussed and explained by Big Rock in great detail, and all was set down. During the four days in the Medicine Lodge, Linderman took part in a medicine smoke which he described in the foreword to Indian old man stories. Russell drew a picture of the setting in the lodge, and Linderman described the scene and the details of the ritual. He said all the essential points of the Chippewa's religion are found in their sacred pipe ceremony, and that, quote, dignity is always present, unquote. From the uh, uh, preface or the foreword, an imaginary trail led straight across the lodge from west to east. It was not occupied nor littered. It was the way for the spirits of all departed beings and was spoken of as the buffalo's trail. A painted lodge is a constantly offered prayer, and as it must face the east, the imaginary trail is also the way of the sun. The first fire in the imaginary trail was the sacred fire the holy fire, and was but four glowing coals that had been taken from the regular lodge fire and deposited in a square, within a square, of the perfectly cleaned earth. Each spear of grass and foreign thing was carefully removed before the coals were deposited, and only sweet grass or sweet sage was burned upon the coals. In the smoke of the incense giving off by the fuel, the pipe bowls, stems, and even the hands of the company were cleansed at the beginning of the ceremony. End quote. The fire itself is like the center pole in the Indian Lodge. Smoke, as it rises through the smoke hole, carries the prayers of the people from the earth below to the supernatural powers in the sky above. In 1917, Russell inscribed a copy of Indian Y stories with a pithy commentary on the immortality of writers. This was inside of a book, uh, the inside, when you open the front cover. It says, the West is dead, my friend, but writers hold the seed, and what they sow will live and grow again to those who read. T.M. Russell, 1917. In that same year, Linderman moved from Helena to a secluded log home he had built at Goose Bay on Flathead Lake, one of his favorite campsites from his youth, to pursue his dedication to, as he put it, preserve what he knew of the Old West in printer's ink. The ancient symbols and stories of the Indian people intrigued Linderman and Russell, who were both adept sign talkers. Once, Linderman and his brother-in-law, Sam Johns, took Russell on an excursion to see the painted rocks, a long panel of pictographs on a large shale cliff south of Goose Bay on Flathead Lake on the west shore. So this is, there, I'm, I'm in a boat, and there's a ledge there, and then these, those reddish colored marks you can see if, it's, it looks like bison and diff different things there. But they're really high. If you were standing there, you wouldn't be able to reach them. Sign or gesture language, which evolved out of pictography long before the written word, is a three-dimensional visual language. It is ideographic writing made in the air. The thought processes involved in communicating through picture or gesture language are abstract, creative, and subconscious. In communicating with tribal historians, Linderman's adept knowledge of sign language gave him a deeper reflection of the mind and spirit of the Indian people. 
Besides his mastery of sign language, he understood other languages hidden to most, but familiar to the native people. He knew the songs of the birds and heard the voice of nature in the big trees, the winds, and the water. After visiting the Crow Reservation in 1926 to meet with old warriors who told him stories for Old Man Coyote, published in 1931, his fourth book of Indian legends, the Reverend John Frost, a Crow minister, wrote to him about the songs of the talking waters. I do hope that we will meet again sometime at the water of many tongues. What I mean by that is what you heard in the creek while lying awake awaiting the return of your unwelcome visitors, the skunks. I thought we Indians were the only ones that understood the language of the waters and the swish of the pines. When I am sad, I go into the mountains and listen to the many songs of the creeks and the soothing words of the pines. You could not have surprised me any more by saying what you heard in that creek than if you had taken a gunshot at me. I would not open up my heart to anyone else but you, for they would say I was crazy, but you understand. On June, 20, on June 6, 1927, Linderman received an honorary doctorate degree from the University of Montana for his literary work and his research in the field of Indian customs, beliefs, and traditions. Years later, Professor Miriam, this is Professor Miriam in his later years, who was teaching at the University of Montana at the time, said, Frank Bird Linderman was one of Montana's most accomplished writers. He possessed a fine conscience in his effort to interpret the red man, an almost fanatically painstaking regard for accuracy, a sense of form, and an ear for language. His writing has lasting value and should be more widely known than it is. Um, just a little side uh, interest is that in 1926, the year Charlie Russell died, he was, uh, before he died, that earlier that year, he was, he received an honorary doctorate from the University of Montana, and then the next year, Linderman did. Well, just here I'll also mention then about in the gallery, the Russell Gallery here, the McKay Gallery, there's the, when you're looking at inside and you're looking at the door, over to the right, there's the unfinished painting of a Kootenai camp on the shores of Swan Lake. And uh, that Russell was working on that when he died in 1926. It was never finished. And I thought that was kind of magical, that he was working on a, that painting where they had gone to Kootenai Lodge in the hunting trips, and, and Linderman had camped when he was a young 17, 18-year-old, and surely told Russell stories about his days there as a youth. And it's the same year that Linderman's book of Kootenai Y stories was published in 1926. So there was something going on with both of them, and the Koot, the, with the Kootenays and their and their youth. I just took that picture years ago, and that's just an array of some of the books. Most of them are out of print again. Some of some that were out of print when I first started my research. When came into print as paperbacks, now they're out of print, so it's back and forth. And uh, uh, you can buy some of them, I think, online through the University of Nebraska Press. In the early days, because of his ability to imitate the songs of the, all the birds in the region, the Chippewa and Cree called Linderman sings like a bird, and old Kootenays named him Bird Singer. In later years, the Chippewa and Cree called him Koskisi Kokat, man who looks through glass. This is a, a, a big piece of driftwood on the shore of Goose Bay in front of the house at Goose Bay. So the uh, Chippewa and Cree called him man who looks through glass, and to the Blackfeet, his name was Iron Tooth. Because of the facility with which he was able to communicate in sign language, the Crow chief Plenty Coup, whom he first met in 1892, gave him the name Mapatsamotsatsa, man who knows sign talk or sign talker. This little carving is in the bark of a cottonwood tree outside of uh, Plenty Coup's home there at Plenty Coup State Park. There's a grove of cottonwood trees, and, 
and uh, I, the um, park service manager who was there at the time told me about it, that a young man from the Flathead Reservation had come over there and he asked if he could carve something on one of the trees and he carved this likeness. It's about this big. And you have to know it's there because it's kind of high. You have to look up for it. I think it's beautiful. <laughs> um, so in 1927 and 28, Linderman went again to the Crow Reservation several times to interview Plenty Coup for what is probably Linderman's best known piece of literary work, first published in 1930 as American, the life story of a great Indian, Plenty Coup, Chief of the Crows, it is now titled more simply, Plenty Coup, Chief of the Crows, and is available still in paperback. It was out of print from the 1930 uh, until the 1960s when it came back into print and going on. I gotta quit. The men sat in the shade of the cottonwood grove beside Plenty Coup's home at Pryor while they worked on the interviewing and storytelling. Linderman used an interpreter, but all the while, he and the old chief communicated through their mutual understanding of sign language. In 1931, Linderman met with Pretty Shield, a Crow medicine woman at Crow Agency. As he interviewed her, they too communicated through the subtleties of sign talk. Originally published in 1932 as Red Mother, now as Pretty Shield, medicine woman of the Crows, this text is an extraordinary contribution to the literary record of Native American oral narrative. Not only was it rare that an Indian woman would tell her stories to a white man, but in this instance, her stories complement those of Chief Plenty Coup as a record of the way of life among the Crow people in the late 1800s. John Frost wrote to Linderman again in May 1930, soon after the publication of American, that the book brings out the Indian as near as can be in writing or words. He closed with a prayer. May the great spirit give you many snows so you can give your race the insides of the Indian's heart, that they may know we Indians as we are, not what others think. I am your friend. After his great accomplishments in recording the stories of Plenty Coup and Pretty Shield, Linderman continued to write and lecture, advocating justice and respect for Indian people until he left this world for the Shadow Hills on May 12, 1938. 